All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sean Sullivan, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on NASA's calibration system for automated fiber placement for the automated fiber placement technology. Our presenter today is Peter Juarez. Peter is a research engineer with the Non-Destructive Evaluation Sciences Branch at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. He specializes in multiple fields of NDE, including ultrasound, thermography, guided wave, and advanced automated data processing. The technology that inspired this patent, the in-situ thermal inspection system for AFP, has been in development at Langley for the last four years and has been utilized in several prototype and production products. Following pre Peter's presentation on the technology, I will be giving a short presentation on how NASA licenses technology to outside organizations. Now, before we get started, I'd like to point out that all of your microphones will be muted throughout all of this presentation. You also can't see the full attendees list, but many of you are here and are filing in at this time. But if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box. It should be in your lower right corner of your screen, and we'll get to them during the last 15 minutes of our Q&A session at the end. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you, Peter. Great. Thank you, Sean. So yeah, uh, like you said, my name is Peter Juarez. Uh, um, thank you for joining me today. So this presentation, we're going to get a little bit into the weeds because uh, this, this technology, this innovation really enables a, another technology that we've been working on. And I have to explain sort of the problem space for why that technology exists and what kind of value this brings. And so we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Oops. And enter, there we go. Okay, so uh, AFP, what is it? Uh, AFP stands for automated fiber placement, and it's the next generation way of how aerospace manufacturers are gonna be making their composite parts for their aircraft. And what it can be sort of uh, analogous is, is a giant robotic tape dispenser. You have spools of carbon fiber prepreg that are cut to a certain width, um, and these, these spool, these, uh, this tape is called a toe. Uh, those toes are lined up in a, a row next to each other, and that row is called a course. And then the, uh, a robotic platform applies that tape onto a surface, whether it be a mandrel or a mold or some sort of tooling surface. And uh, it does that layer by layer to build up additively a complex structure uh, made of composites uh, for use mostly in aerospace components. Um, if you ever went uh, flown on Air, uh, Boeing 737, uh, the fuselage section and parts of the wing are made with automated fire placement. And uh, so it's, it's a, a great way to repeatedly build large uh, composite structures um, and have you know very little scrap waste because you're you're now putting composite almost exactly where the uh, it needs to be and you don't have to trim off any excess. Now there are some uh, so every thing that you're going to see in this presentation uh, was done on a AFP machine we have here at Langley called Isaac, which stands for the Integrated Structural Assembly of Advanced Composites. And so I just uh, credit where credits due. They've enabled this research uh, to be possible, and we wouldn't have been able to get this far without them. And so AFP does have uh, uh, some challenges when this layup. So there's a lot of advantages, but there's some disadvantages. And one of the things is the toes that you're laying down don't always go where exactly you want them to, whether it be because of uh, error in the motion of the robot, wandering of the toes, complex geometry, so on and so forth. There's a lot of variability. There can be a lot of variability on where the placement, uh, where the placement of the toe actually ends up, and so those defects are primarily are concerned with overlaps and gaps. Uh, but there's also thing like FOD, where there's uh, material underneath where you laid up, and it's not supposed to be included into, into there. Uh, there's buckling and, and other things like that. Uh, but the my primary concern is uh, overlaps and gaps, and what those are is when the toe of uh, uh, in one in, in the course, if one toe is overlapping another, or if, if there's a gap between the toes as you're laying them up, and those types of defects can uh, impart as much as like a 32% reduction in strength, depending on what your application is and what the uh, severity of the defect is. Uh, so these kind of defects have to be caught before the material is baked in an autoclave, and the overlapping gap defects are there for life. And so the, the, the way they, they, they detect for these right now 
is completely 100% manual inspection, every, every single ply. And so they go. you have technicians that go up after each ply with magnifying optics and, and lights uh, to try to find these gap and overlap defects. Uh, and it's, it's a very, you know, it's not a very precise way of measurement. Because if you look on the picture on the left, we have a twist and uh, two overlaps and a gap in that panel. But it's such a low contrast environment. It has, uh, the composite itself has so much texture uh, unless you're at the right angle, even at, from this picture, you can't tell that those defects are actually there. I know they're there because I put them there, but just from looking at that, you're not going to be able to uh, understand them. I, and, and so much time is devoted to this that uh, studies have been done to see what the allocation of cell time is actually for, done with inspection. And you're looking at about 42% of, of total cell time used for inspection and data review, and while only 19% of that cell time is actual physical layup. And ideally, you want those two numbers reversed, uh, but that's that's what exists today. And so uh, before I get into the technology we've developed, I'll, I'll say there's a whole bunch of people working on this problem right now. Uh, there's systems that are being developed that use laser profilometry, that use vision systems, that use multiple spectral systems, and there's a whole bunch of advantages and disadvantages to all these. Um, this is more uh, what we've developed using infrared is just another way to do it. Um, and so this is the technology, the innovation I'm going to be describing today can benefit all these technologies, not just the one uh, that we've developed here at Langley. But what we did here at Langley was we decided, hey, let's put a infrared camera on the AFP machine. And since every single AFP machine has some sort of preheating element that is leading the compaction roller, um, that's heating up the substrate that, or the material that was already laid down so that when you lay down new material, it's tacky enough and can consolidate and compact well into the substrate. Uh, and so what we're doing with the infrared camera is we're watching as that preheated substrate, the heat from that, goes through the material that we just laid down. And so with that, you can impart some sort of knowledge on how well you laid down that material. And so just looking at overlaps and gaps, for instance, if you have an overlap, now you're conducting that heat through twice the amount of material that you were before. And so it's going to have a different characteristic heating and cooling curve. Uh, immediately, it's going to show up as a cold spot. Um, and on the flip side, if you have a gap, you're not going to see any heating and cooling. It's just going to be immediately cooling. And it's going to be a much higher temperature because you're looking at just the preheated substrate itself. And uh, so, in fact, anything that happens between those, the, the old layer, uh, the uh, substrate and the new layer, we can see in the thermal data. And so it just, we did that. Uh, we, we've developed that system and put it on Isaac uh, here at NASA Langley, and it's been used on several different projects for their quality control and process um, uh, process development cycle. And we've been really, really successful in that. And uh, so j just to give you an idea of what that kind of data looks like, now we have a uh, image here. This is one single frame of the movie that we record with the IR camera. And now the overlaps and gaps are readily apparent in the course. Um, the uh, bright lines are going to be the the actual gaps in between toes, and the dark lines are going to be the overlaps. Um, and so uh, this is distinct enough and and you know obvious enough that you can even build a computer vision system, uh, some sort of machine learning algorithm to automatically identify these defects and call them out at the end of a plot, which is something we've done as well. So anyway. Um, once you get that, you can even do some more complex things with the data where you can construct a, a holistic model, a data reconstruction of your entire part, your entire ply, and you can see how your process parameters are exactly affecting your part quality. And so not only can you track a defect across from one course to the other, but you can also track defects through the plies. And so now if something's not in spec, or if something is uh, a defect is in spec, in specifications, for one ply, but it's lined up over uh, 12 other defects below it, then all of a sudden that's out of spec. You can track it if you have um, sensitive enough data and you can reconstruct it three-dimensionally like this. Now, so that's all great. We, we, we've done that. Uh, we, we, you can add uh, extra value at, and decision-making support to your project with this, but there's one issue. No matter what inspection system you use, you have to be able to qualify that inspection system, and you have to be able to uh, have confidence in the inspection system's results. And the way you do that is through calibration. And so with calibration, you can say definitively, my uh, inspection system can pick up this defect, this size, and uh, 
you know, sort of give context to how well your system is going to perform in a real world application. And to make it and to in order to calibrate it, you need to have representative defects, which is the crux of the innovation that I'm going to be describing here today. And so let's say you wanted to make toe tape defects right now. Uh, what most people do is they'll lay up a course a material, and then they will, using the programming of the robot, lay up another course that slightly overlaps the course that you just laid up, and now you have an overlap. And then on the third course, you uh, use the computer, you, the uh, programming again to make a small gap between the second course and the third course. And so that works, uh, but in, in real life, you're not always going to have a overlapping gap at the edge of courses. A lot of times they'll happen in the middle of the course, and sometimes um, making those little adjustments are going to be hard with complex geometry. Um, and it's not only that, but the play, the machine placement itself is not 100% accurate. And we know this because labs and gaps happen right now anyway. And so how do you make repeatable defects of a known size and of known quantity and known location without um, uh, it, during the actual layup and not in some sort of post layup process. Because uh, another way you can do this is you lay up a perfect ply and then you pick up toes and place them uh, to make an artificial gap. But that's not really a in process inspection. You're you're now inspecting as a post process and things are a little different. And so how we solve this problem? Well, first let's look at the cross section of, of an overlap and gap defect. Um, on an overlap, you have two layers of material. On a normal layup, you only have one layer of material on top of the substrate. And on a gap, you have zero layers of material. You only have the substrate. And so if you look at this, just this cross section, you, you can realize that these, uh, these layers of material do not have to be continuous to look like a defect. And so what you could do is just take one single toe and uh, shave it, sort of shape it to be a little thinner than the rest of the toes. And when it lays up, it's going to have a natural gap in between the other toes because it's supposed to be laid up right next to it. Um, and it'll look like a gap, uh, a natural occurring gap. Conversely, if you take that material that you took off the, uh, the original toe and put it on a different toe, now that you have two layers of material, that's going to look like an overlap in your, in your data. And that's exactly what we did. So here we have a, uh, an eighth inch uh, overlap and gap defect that we simulated where we took a little tab out from a, a piece of a toe, uh, and this was before it was even laid up. It, we did it while it was still on the machine, and so when the machine laid this up, it made a overlapping gap defect exactly where we wanted it of a known size and quantity. Um, and so, you know, so that, that works. We wanted an easy way to do it as well. So what we made is a small sort of stencil jig that can fit on the toe and you can allows you to use it when it's the materials on the spool or even um, uh, when it, the material is still in the machine. And so you, you line that jig up with your or that stencil up with the toe you want to cut. You put the cover over it and then you use a razor blade or an exacto knife or even uh, you can have cut it, cutting elements in the stencil itself. So when you close the lid, it automatically cut it. Um, but once you cut that tab out and place that into a, an adjacent toe and lay that up, now you have something that looks like to your inspection system, exactly like an overlap and gap defect. And by print, by making these stencils in different sizes, you can simulate different sizes of overlap and gap defect. So not only the length, but also the width. And so again, that's what we, that's what we use to make this defect. It's a quarter inch, uh, an eighth of an inch overlap and gap defect. And by doing this, um, one of our fears was we're going to compromise the integrity of the of the toe and it might jam up the machine. It was fine. Um, this is half the width of the toe that we cut off and it's still laid up perfectly. And then um, in order to really qualify your system, you want to see how, what's the smallest defect you can get. And so we went smaller and smaller to get uh, even more fine resolution on our inspection system. And so here we have a two millimeter overlap and gap. Uh, it's getting harder to see because, again, this is a low contrast environment. We have an overlap tab that we pasted right here and a gap right here. And again, these were all made before it was laid up. And then here's a one millimeter gap um, and overlap that was uh, we used for calibration. 
And so what do these artificial defects look like? Well, it, they look exactly like overlaps and gaps in, in, the, in a real life setting. Um, and here we have a two millimeter gap simulated right here. And uh, again, it just shows up as a, as a bright spot, a bright line in the layup between the coarse toes. And here we have one of those eighth inch overlapping gap defects, um, you know, very, very apparent. And then this on the right is a sort of a, a data reconstruction to show the entire ply where that defect is. And, it, and from just looking at it, it looks like a toe just immediately shifted over to the right by an eighth of an inch and then went back on the course. Um, so, and so you can use this data to not only qualify your inspection system, um, but now say if you wanted to make some sort of automated defect recognition algorithm using machine learning that requires a lot of training data, now you can uh, build uh, mountains of data sets without having to find these defects in the wild and make a train, uh, train your machine learning algorithm to find these in a real world application. And so that, that's what we did, and that's uh, what this uh, patent is really concerning. And uh, so at this point, um, I will take any questions if there are any.